Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Sun, and I'm joined by my colleague, Livio Zeely, who's the Senior Legal Advisor and UN Representative at the International Commission of Jurists. And I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Global Health at the Dornsite School of Public Health at Drexel University. And we'd like to thank the Center for Ethics and Professor Marcus Duber for inviting us to give this talk about a paper we wrote recently. So we were a bit alarmed, Livio and I, we've, we've been working on uh, issues related to criminalization and public health related to reproductive health and other issues for a while. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we saw a trend, an alarming trend on the use of criminal law. So Livio and I got together and we thought, you know, it might be interesting to outline some precedents about how criminal law has been used within public health before and think through some intellectual tools to help us think about, you know, what are the considerations we should look at when discussing COVID related criminalization. And so Livio, you know, when I reached out to you and we started talking about this, what were some of your thoughts on it in terms of how we could look at the categorizations and what we were seeing, you know, happen on the ground with the use of criminal law and COVID-19? Thanks, Nina. So um, as you know, we discussed what was happening and what we were seeing in terms of the fact that states in their responses to uh, COVID-19, we're reaching out for the criminal law. And we were trying to analyze the situation and, as you say, provide intellectual tools to categorize what's ha what was happening from both a criminal law, a human rights law, and a public health perspective. And uh, as you said, you know, we were very alarmed about the fact that uh, states were using the criminal law because we were questioning really the advisability, the effectiveness uh, of criminal law in responses to what for all intents and purposes is, is, a, is a public health emergencies. And, and we obviously seriously doubted the consistency of uh, those criminal law responses with human rights law and standards. And as we began to try to unpack what was happening, I think we saw two main areas, uh, two main categories um, to, to, to within which to effectively uh, compartmentalize and analyze the state's resort to criminal law. Um, they, they were both, they both had the aim, the stated aim of reducing transmission of COVID-19, um, but they were really two distinct ways. One was the criminalization of COVID exposure and transmission, and the second one was uh, the resort to criminal law uh, in the enforcement of public health measures um, through, through criminal sanctions. So, I'd like to turn first quickly to um, the criminalization of, of exposure and transmission of COVID. And um, this this analysis, I, would, I should premise by saying that obviously our analysis is very anecdotal and, and this is a big caveat, but we, we did see uh, uh, and we have some examples of specific examples of states resorting to criminalizing exposure and transmission of COVID. For example, China's Hubei uh, provinces, the authorities announced that people with confirmed COVID infections would face criminal proceedings if they spat in public because they were thereby intentionally spreading the virus. And most alarmingly, um, South Africa, in their response to COVID-19, enacted in March uh, new criminal offences under the Disaster Management Act to explicitly criminalise COVID exposure and transmission. And the regulations in particular proclaim that any person who intentionally uh, exposes another person to COVID-19 may be prosecuted for an offence, including assault or attempted murder. And in fact, in South Africa, there are currently two people are being um, that that we know of two people that are being prosecuted uh, one uh, has been charged with attempted murder the offense of um, a transmission is bolted onto um, the the murder the crime of murder and this person who had traveled abroad and had contracted covid um, 
went to work despite the fact that he had tested positive to COVID and had been told to self-quarantine. He went to work and also attended a public gathering, a uh, religious public gathering, and now has been charged with, um, with attempted murder. And so this in particular, the criminalization of exposure uh, and transmission of COVID has uh, had certain echoes for, for uh, Nina, uh, for, for you and I, Nina, and, and in fact, uh, particularly South Africa with the checkered history that it has with respect to the criminalization of, of HIV uh, made us really uh, kind of sit up uh, and think carefully about what might be the implication of criminalization of COVID exposure and transmission. So I want to turn to you, Nina, to perhaps give us a brief summary um, in, in terms from a, from a public health perspective of the history of, of criminal criminalization of uh, HIV exposure, non-disclosure and transmission. Yeah, great. Thanks, Livia. So as you mentioned, when we talk about HIV criminalization, what we're talking about is actually laws that criminalize HIV non-disclosure, meaning you don't tell your HIV status, exposure and transmission. And most of these laws, many of them were enacted early on in the HIV response. So rather than being driven by evidence and science, a lot of them were driven by stigma and discrimination. And over the past 40 years, what we've seen is that these laws have been found to violate public health and human rights norms. And they've been found to mostly be inconsistent with principles of substantive criminal law. So over the many decades in the HIV response, there's only one very, very rare exception that the criminal law has been used. And that's really to prosecute truly blameworthy cases where the criminal law is needed to achieve justice. And what that means is that it's only applied for intentional transmission, where a person knows their status, acts with the intent to transmit, and does indeed transmit HIV. However, the vast majority of the laws related to HIV non-disclosure, exposure, and transmission are overly broad, they're vague, they're not based on evidence and science, they have been disproportionately applied to marginalized groups. And therefore, there's been a strong call to repeal the majority of these laws. We also know that HIV-related criminalization increases stigma and discrimination for the disease. And this can also have significant impacts on the HIV response itself. So for instance, there have been studies to find that HIV-related criminal laws actually dis disincentivizes and deters people from seeking out HIV testing services. So Livio, turning back to you, can you give us some considerations about you know, what you and I had discussed in applying these same principles or reasonings to criminalization of COVID-19? Yes, and I, I will turn again back mm. to the example that I mentioned about South Africa, because actually there is this, uh, at least one of those cases is going forward. And uh, some of it um, will obviously depend on um, what happens with the, with the state of knowledge um, that we have, scientific knowledge that we have in terms of uh, how COVID-19 is transmitted and, and how obviously people uh, can be exposed to it. But based on, on previous uh, precedents concerning, for example, HIV um, transmission in, in South Africa, virus transmission attempt to murder have the unique requirements that they need what that there are certain things that need to be proven before someone uh, is convicted. First of all, it must be proven that the accused has a communicable disease, that they are aware that they are infected and they have infected another person. And they have to have engaged in, in behavior that puts people at risk of being infected. And they also have have intended that their actions would put uh, others at risk or have been completely negligent about that. Uh, and finally, there's also a criterion or requirement that uh, that the the virus that we, the, the the disease that we 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 um, concerned with is one that potentially diminishes or shortens the lifespan um, uh, of a person. And I think when you when you turn to then what's happening with COVID, then um, I, th 
to me, that re raises really a question from a substantive criminal law perspective. Um, first, like I said, we don't really have uh, a current state of knowledge about COVID-19, which would indicate to me that it would be very quite difficult uh, to, to prosecute people, uh, particularly in, in transmission cases. Um, first, proving culpability uh, also, the, the intention, the blameworthiness that you, you mentioned, Dina, uh, would appear extremely, extremely hard. Uh, and even the, the criminalized of, of act of COVID transmission may be just too vague or overbroad to comply with foundational principles of criminal law. I see, to me, um, the, the offenses, or rather to us in our analysis, the, the offenses around uh, COVID transmission um, including obviously the possibility um, and rate of asymptomatic transmissions, the fact that you know vi uh, the fact that people might be transmitting uh, the virus but have no symptoms of the illness themselves. I mean, clearly that the, the, there is no scientifically. I, I don't think that we have a state of knowledge that would be able to make good of some of the prosecution claims. And, and obviously this, this raises questions about the principle of legality, the vagueness of, of, of the criminal law, the lack of specificity, um, and, and obviously also with respect to, to intent. Um, but I, I think part of the analysis was also our concerns about the effectiveness of, of criminal law as a public health measures particularly given, as, as you said, Nina, go, going back to HIV, the fact that criminalization of HIV increased stigma. And so I, what, what, in your opinion, what are the public health considerations that need to be um, taken into account when, uh, when considering whether or not to resort to the criminal law in a public health emergency, Nina? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the one of the biggest questions in addition to kind of the, these substantive criminal questions that you've raised in terms of the application of criminal law is the fact that criminalization of COVID-19 exposure and transmission like HIV risks undermining public health outcomes, which was, you know, arguably the point of enacting these laws in the first place. So you've raised the point already, Livio, of increasing stigma and discrimination and how it can deter people away from testing and care. There's also the big consideration of the fact that, you know, if these laws result in incarceration and imprisonment, that for sure is a major public health concern right now in the COVID-19 response. We know that people in prisons and other closed settings are at higher risk of acquiring COVID-19. First of all, they have difficulty in actually conducting social distancing requirements because they are in closed settings, but also there's limited access to medical services in these settings. And what we're seeing now, which is a, a, a positive development, is that we're actually seeing some countries releasing and trying to decongest prisons and other closed settings. So they're looking at, you know, who is currently incarcerated, who might be highly vulnerable, they have underlying health conditions, and they're coming to the end of their terms, or they're, you know, in, in prison for low level offenses, how can we decarcerate the populations there. And we're also seeing countries delaying some criminal trials because of these concerns. So if on one hand, the state is also criminalizing exposure and transmission and risking more people to be put into closed settings, this inherently undermines the ultimate public health goal of slowing transmission. But you know, this was really the first category of what we talked about. And on, in this category, it's clear for us to say that because of considerations and reasons related to public health outcomes, criminal law, as well as alignment with human rights law, countries should refrain from criminalizing COVID-related exposure and transmission. But you know, the second category that you brought up earlier, Livio, is really talking about countries that have started criminalizing public health measures. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what we're seeing there. Indeed. So um, 
as you remember, we were trying to get our heads around what was happening. And indeed, we saw uh, a first uh, kind of swath, swath of measures addressing, uh, using the criminal law to address uh, um, transmission and exposure of COVID. But also uh, states have started resorting to criminal law in their COVID-19 responses to um, enforce violations of public health measures. And... Um, what, what these are conceptually quite quite different from criminalization of covid exposure and transmission and we've um, they both i mean in common with criminalization of covid uh, transmission or exposure they both have the stated aim or the, the similar aim to reduce the spread of the disease but what's being criminalized is the failure to comply with a whole host of measures and we've all become accustomed with term, you know, hearing terms like quarantine, lockdown, isolation, social distancing. And sometimes, you know, these terms have been used uh, interchangeably, um, but they actually all have um, different, slightly different meanings. Um, but they all share the same goal to slow the transmission of the disease. And some states have indeed turned to the criminal law to enforce some of these public health measures in their COVID responses. So, for example, Italy, um, and which is currently still under national quarantine law, uh, has uh, had, had charged uh, a huge number of people uh, for violations of the, of the quarantine. And I confirmed that um, people who had, you know, repeat offenders, uh, for example, uh, could risk uh, not just fines, but also uh, jail time. Similarly, with respect to Argentina, um, anybody who does not follow the mandatory isolation or quarantine could face imprisonment to, from six months to two years. Bulgaria, we know that there are at the time when when Nina and I wrote the blog, um, we knew that there were seven cases of individuals that been charged for violate, violating the quarantine rules, and again they were risking up to five years imprisonment uh, upon conviction. And there are also other countries: United Arab, Arab Emirates, Canada, the Philippines, Israel, Norway. There's a, a whole host of countries. Um, I I don't know because uh, I has I haven't uh, seen a confirmation of that, but I heard like a huge number of people have been arrested, for example, in Morocco for violations of the the quarantine uh, measures. Of course, there are some uh, resorts to to these measures which are uh, completely manipulative, and you know. Uh, we, we've seen countries that are using those to go after human rights defenders or marginalized individuals and so on in ways that have nothing to do with violations of, of the quarantine. Uganda is a typical example where uh, um, an, a, a shelter for uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender individuals were, was raided and people were taken into custody allegedly for violating uh, the quarantine measures. But just taking what states are doing at face value and considering the use of the criminal law in enforcing public health measures to, to us clearly raises some fundamental questions. Um, and I, uh, what we have tried to do is to look at some of the criteria to which um, the resort to the criminal law should be analyzed in this context. So both under... Um, human rights standards, but under human rights law, but also under um, uh, notions of the criminal law, uh, of criminal law notions and notions concerning separation of powers and rule of law, uh, we know that uh, in order to justify the resort to uh, restrictions, and in particular the most uh, coercive forms of restrictions, the ones imposed through the use of criminal sanctions, those laws must conform comport, must conform and be consistent with principle legality, necessity, last resort, non-arbitrariness, reasonableness. They need to be rationally connected to the legitimate aim that's being pursued. They need to be proportionate. They need to be non-discriminatory. And it seems to us that states, what states should be doing in, 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 in guaranteeing that the uh, 
response to the crisis is one that upholds human rights and, and is one in which the resort to force and the resort to the criminal law is consistent with basic principles, the legality rule law uh, and human rights is one that takes all of those standards in, in, into account. And uh, I think what was helpful to us, Nina, was to turn to perhaps lessons again from the past that should have been learned and perhaps is not too late that could be learned uh, in terms of measures that could be drawn upon um, in in a in a sort of human rights compliant public health response so apart from the um, the HIV lessons um, what would you say Nina were the kind of lessons uh, to be learned or that could be still deployed yeah, thanks, Livio. So, you know, in the first part of our analysis, we really looked at HIV, but in thinking about the second category of criminalization of violations of public health measures, we thought, you know, maybe actually tuberculosis might be an interesting case study. So, you know, tuberculosis or TB as it's known as its short form, it's a contagious disease that is curable with detection and proper treatment. So in some cases, this involves the need to isolate a person with active TB to prevent onboard transmission. But it's a, it's a common norm and practice in the TB response to know that effective TB responses rely on voluntary, autonomous, and informed decision-making of the person receiving treatment. But however, public health and human rights standards do cater for the very, very rare cases that necessitates involuntary isolation or treatment. And here we, you know, we, we hearken back to the principles that Livio has just uh, brought up, which are really the standards of international human rights law under the Syracuse principles, which means that this compulsory treatment and involuntary isolation and treatment can only happen if it's provided for um, and in accordance with the law, it has a legitimate aim, it's strictly necessary, it takes, importantly, the least restrictive approach it's not arbitrary or discriminatory, and it is subject to review. So, you know, Livio, you and I were talking about this when writing our article, how might some of these principles be applied when we talk about COVID-19? What might we look at? Um, so I, I think some of the, um, some of those, those principles to us raised important questions in analyzing the resort to the criminal law. I mean, you mentioned um, the, the, some of the lessons that could be, uh, could be applied from the responses, the public health responses to, to tuberculosis. And if, if it, it's uh, one of the key uh, principle in uh, human rights law in terms of um, containing the resort uh, to the criminal law is that the criminal law must be, the resort to criminal law must be justified by the state as absolutely necessary. And I think this is clearly an area where the judge is still out. And I don't think that the states have actually adequately demonstrated that they can Im immediately jump through the hoops and resort to the most coercive sanction that is the criminal law, with a view to imposing deprivation of liberty in the in the worst case scenarios upon conviction for people when they violated public health measures, is it is that the most effective? Is that the only and the necessary uh, response, or should, as you said, Nina, going back to the TB example, should, for example, other approaches being uh, looked at, and what could be, for example, the consideration to uh, uh, an approach that is not so restrictive, but actually could prove to be much more effective. What, what, what would that look like to you, Nina? Yeah, well, I mean, public health and human rights experts have kind of been trying to shout and highlight the importance of taking voluntary measures and really scaling up voluntary measures to to enforce compliance with quarantines or to um, not enforce, for, enforce is the wrong word, to support compliance with 
quarantines. And so what we talk about there is, you know, more community level activities such as clear and consistent and transparent communications based on evidence and, uh, you know, understanding that the evidence changes, COVID-19 and the new coronavirus, you know, there's still a lot that's unknown. So that information might change and it's important to have that transparency and those channels of communications between decision makers and communities so that there's an understanding of you know, why, why is it important to comply? And also, what are the needs of communities? What are they not receiving that makes it more difficult for them to comply? And also, there's an importance to provide support services. So this can include financial support services, social, psychosocial support services, and really importantly, um, you know, governments have an obligation to ensure that people who are under quarantine have access to basic needs. So they have access to food, they have access to clean water, they have access to adequate shelter. And if there are other rights violations that are occurring, such as, you know, we're seeing an incidence and a rise in, you know, domestic reports of domestic abuse um, in shelter in place orders, all of these concerns have to be addressed and listened to and understanding, you know, what are, why aren't people able to stay in quarantine and really trying to address those needs and keeping those channels of communications open and developing stronger trust between communities and um, decision makers is, is really key and important. And for us, Livio, I think, um, you know, one of the concerns that we had when we were looking at this trend was really that states seemed to be jumping to criminal law as the immediate response, as opposed to, to first scaling up these voluntary measures and these activities that really can support people within communities to, to adhere to, to understand and adhere to quarantine um, guidelines, essentially. And you know, on a on a related topic that you brought up earlier, Livio, in, in terms of introducing this, you know, for us, I think it was important to also differentiate the misuse of criminal law and emergency powers in this situation. So we've also seen, you know, countries where law enforcement or decision makers have specifically used criminal law to target marginalized groups such as the LGBTI community. And this is always a human rights violation. It is, it, there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is very clear under human rights law that it's not allowed. And it's also obviously not appropriate to use criminal law in this respect as well. But Olivia, what are some other considerations that we had discussed under emergency powers? Well, the, to, to us, I think one of the critical concerns was the fact that uh, there was a lack of, um, there, there was a, there's a lack of uh, kind of uh, the scientific case for, and for justifying the resort to the criminal law. But I think um, looking again at, at history, uh, it's, uh, I think it's unsurprising that uh, faced with an emergency, states have, as you said, uh, gone straight for the for the criminal law. We've seen it in the past, in uh, in the context of emergency situations, um, for example, uh, in the context of uh, the responses to um, 9/11, um, and uh, also going back to. Um, previous in in the history of, of countries um, subject to uh, um, emergency regimes, and I, again, what we see is that the criminal law is being is the most coercive tool, and it's the one that's being resorted to immediately. And and the concern I think that we had was that if you're looking at um, looking back at, uh, at, at those uh, historical examples, once those extraordinary measures are introduced in connection with a situation that was qualified as an emergency threatening the life of the nations, whether in good or bad faith, um, they, these measures have, have, a, have found their way they found they have an uncanny way of actually seeping through into the ordinary um, 
legal framework in in states uh, and uh, somewhat they they seem to stick um, way after the emergency that had arisen and in connection with which they've been uh, adopted has subsided. So again, if you take uh, terrorism uh, in 2015, uh, France introduced extraordinary measures in response to the terrorist attacks uh, in, in, uh, in Paris. Um, and these measures have, are now in, uh, found their ways into uh, the ordinary legislation. So this is something, this is definitely an area we will have to watch out for because um, it, it might well be that even when the COVID-19 um, emergency has subsided, those new uh, resources to the criminal law, those new offences that were introduced in connection to COVID-19 will remain on the statute books. And, and that's really a matter uh, of concern. But Nina, in, we kind of coming up to uh, the, uh, the end of our talk, but I wanted mm -hmm. to kind of s s ask you what you thought might be the way forwards for states to try to think about what actually could be done that does not, that is consistent with, with human rights and uh, with public health objectives and also consistent with fundamental notions of the criminal law. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway that you and I've had in, in discussing all of the country examples that we've seen and also how previous public health precedents might apply for COVID-19 is really the importance of crafting and developing laws and policies related to COVID-19 that are evidence-based and that are aligned with human rights. Otherwise, you completely risk undermining public health outcomes, which are the reasons why these laws were implemented in the first place, in addition to violating fundamental rights and freedoms. You know, the, the other, the other thing I wanted to flag is that, you know, you and I have discussed and I think the world has seen an increase in some pretty terrible practices in terms of the use of criminal law. But again, we're also seeing the emergence of some good practices in terms of, you know, how how countries have been, you know, decongesting and decarcerating their their prison systems as well as you know um, reforming their criminal justice systems in terms of access to courts and so these should really be documented and uh, serve as a precedent for you know pandemic preparedness in the future another area that you and i have discussed in terms of um, areas for future work is looking at how to work better with law enforcement so how can law enforcement um, regulations and practices be more aligned with human rights and more aligned with public health outcomes. Um, and, you know, I, I just, just think overall, it's important to track the good practices that come out of this, as well as, you know, the bad ones, because once we track good practices and document what's being done well, we'll have a better idea of how to respond in terms of lockdowns, quarantines, etc. If and when this will come up again in the future. So any other thoughts, Livio? Well, perhaps just to end, I, I think I wanna pick up on what you just said. And, and uh, this is uh, our call to those of uh, you uh, listening or watching us. I think what Nina said is absolutely spot on. It's really important at this critical time to document both the bad practices, but also the good practices, because in the future, we'll be able to rely on those documented instances in our advocacy and seek to engage states by showing, do, having documented, uh, having uh, provided an analytical framework to uh, evaluate what will happen in the COVID responses to see what works and what doesn't work. We are sure that uh, human rights law and um, you know, global, a, a, a public health response that is informed by uh, human rights is the most effective in this pandemic as it's been proven to be the case with respect to other pa pandemics. And I, I think that's where our efforts have gone in terms of uh, analyzing the, the resort to criminal law and, and try to critique it. But also I, I think perhaps when looking back 
and and uh, also using um, referring back to the um, the sustainable development and goals. I think it's it's really important that law and policies, um, particularly in the in the area of public health, uh, when that they be informed by the idea. Um, that nobody should be left behind, uh, and it, it's very, uh, very likely that in fact, um, if states uh, collectively tackle this by seeking to reach out to those who are the most marginalised, the most vulnerable, uh, perhaps the ones that are not capable of given that the lack of means, given the fact that they don't have access to livelihoods, to shelter, to food, um, they don't necessarily have means to comply with lockdown measures, for example, that those be put um, at the top of the public health response because public health responses that meet the needs, that they are capable of meeting the needs of those groups the, the ones that should not be left behind would probably be the most effective globally for the rest of the population. Um, so with those uh, final words, I wanted to thank uh, Nina San uh, and uh, also Professor Marcus Duber and the Center of Ethics at Toronto University for having given us uh, the opportunity to talk to you today. And uh, thanks very much uh, for listening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.